Okay, so let me share the screen. Recording stopped. Really? <laughs> Recording in progress. Oh, Krishna. Okay, so everyone able to see the screen? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Okay, lesson four, we're on second chapter and we're looking at this section on Gyan. Let's see, the review, oh, the significance of Sri Bhagavan Vacha in the second verse. Anyone like to comment on that? What was the significance to, of it? Sri Bhagavan Uvacha? How do we understand this as being significant? Uh, Maharaj, I, I, I try to uh, give some uh, words. So, uh, like, uh, when, uh, if, like, uh, we give significance to uh, uh, Ganga Mai, uh, because uh, it is from the uh, uh, foot of uh, Sri Hari. So, but here the words we are reading is uh, uh, is spoken by was spoken by direct from the Lord. So that is the significance that what the, the instructions we are reading is direct from the Lord. So Sri Bhagwan Vaj. Yes, very good, Prabhu. Thank you. Directly from the supreme personality of Godhead. So, absolute statements. Okay, then second point, discuss general principles drawn from Arjuna's dilemma and surrender to Krishna and their relevance for our own practice of Krishna consciousness. So, of course, you did that as an exercise and we heard some of the uh, different principles there. General principles, attachment to the family, bodily identification, these kind of things create the difficulty. And then, of course, we have to deal with non devotees, it makes it difficult sometimes in our practice of Krishna consciousness. And then, third point the concept of individuality of the soul, both in the conditioned and liberated states that's stated very clearly by Lord Krishna, that we're eternally individuals. When we're in the material world or in the spiritual world, we remain individuals. Arguments to defeat Mayavadi concept of the soul merging after liberation. Did anyone come up with any answers to this? In one purport, Jiva, uh, Prabhupada quotes Jiva Goswami, he gives the example about the green birds flying into the green tree. So they appear to merge, but the birds are still there in the tree. They keep their individuality. They fly into the tree, but they don't become one with the tree. They keep their individuality. And the same, or in the same way, you go, we go into a room, we enter into a room, it doesn't mean we become the room. We maintain our individuality. You go into the room and come out of the room, you're still in, in, in the room also. You're a person, you're an individual. And so the Mayavadi concept of merging, is just we just don't see it anywhere. Of course, they give the example of, of rivers which flow into the sea and become one. They give that example. We don't accept that example, right? How do we argue against that example? All the rivers flowing into the sea and becoming one with the sea? Anyone?
You haven't studied nectar of devotion yet, huh? No. All right, so uh, the example is given that in the nectar of devotion that yeah, the rivers flow into the sea and become one, but within the ocean there are so many aquatics, there's so many fish coming from the rivers and they're flowing into the sea, they don't become one with the sea, they keep their individuality. There's fish, the aquatics, they're going into the ocean, they don't merge, they don't lose their individuality, they keep their identity. And so we don't, we don't accept their Mayavadi concept of merging. Then, next point, the process of transmigration in text number 13, and that's simply changing body. If we change from one body, as we change in this body, from childhood to youth to old age, similarly the time of death, we give up one body and take another body. And then, from personal experience, the importance of the quality of tolerance and practical ways to achieve it. The importance of the quality of tolerance. Well, certainly for all of us as devotees, it's really important, it's essential. We want to show good qualities. And one of the important qualities which we like to see in people, the quality of tolerance. If we get all disturbed and easily angered and lose our impartiality, we become, you know, just a, a, a victim of our own mind and we become unstable, it's not good. We have to tolerate. And the example is there in all the saintly persons, Lord Jesus Christ, Haridas Thakur, Lord Buddha, Srila Prabhupada, they all showed this quality of tolerance. It's, it's very important for all of us as devotees that we should be tolerant and people may abuse us, they may not, okay, we just tolerate. And practical ways to develop it, well, you can do things like fasting, you can put yourself through austerities, uh, cold water baths, depriving yourself of sleep. You can do things like this, but it's not really necessary. What is required is simply practice devotional service. You go ahead and uh, engage in the activities of devotional service, hearing and chanting regularly, requires a lot of tolerance. To sit and chant every day and to hear classes and to uh, to look, uh, engage in activities like Sankirtan with devotees. All of these things are good training in tolerance. All right, are there any questions or comments on this before we go on? Anybody? No? Okay, then we'll go, we'll go ahead. Krishna defeats argument of compassion. So Lord Krishna was presenting the philosophy, the, the Sankhya philosophy or the, the Jnana philosophy for the soul. There's no birth or death at any time. We want to come to that consciousness, understanding ourselves as a soul. Going ahead. Veda vinashinam nidyam yai namajam avyayam katam sapurusha parta kam gatayanti hanti kam. O parta, how can a person who knows that the soul is indestructible, eternal, unborn, and immutable kill anyone or cause anyone to kill? Okay, so this is a question being asked. How can a person know? How can a person who knows his soul is eternal, how could they engage in it? How can they kill anyone? They can't. 
you can't kill anyone. Hmm? Lord Krishna is explaining, the soul is never not going to die, so you're not going to kill anyone. So it's not a problem. Prabhupada explains, everything has its proper utility. And a man who is situated in complete knowledge knows how and where to apply a thing for its proper utility. Similarly, violence also has its utility, and how to apply violence rests with the person in knowledge. How to apply violence? So this is a question we want you to discuss. When is violence justified? Let's have an open discussion. Let's hear from some members of the class. Kindly explain. When is violence justified? Any of your are parents there, maybe? <laughs> Do you get Maharaj, yes. in case when a surgeon performs an operation or something like it apparently is violence that they are using a blade, they are using all funny things, but it is actually to cure the patient. Oh, okay. So, so surgery, doctors, they're, they, they're use of violence to, for healing, um, maybe you have an infection, and they have to lance the wound, so sometimes things like that. So in that case, that's one example of where violence is justified. It's not really, we don't really think of that as violence, though. So. Some other examples? Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj in self-defense? Self-defense. You're attacked by someone. You should defend yourself. Also, Maharaj, well, be just a minute. Wait about, um, just a minute. Self-defense. You know, is that justified? Is that a justified use of violence? Somebody comes with us, you know, we can defend ourselves, but are we justified to become violent against them? Are you going to use, you can use defense, you can defend yourself, but are you justified to attack someone? Are you going to, are you, you know, somebody attacks you, you, you may, Defend yourself, all right, but you're not going to use violence against him. If you do, you can get in trouble with the police. They can charge you with the, you know, because because you, you have, well, actually we have no right to to inflict violence on any other person. It's not legal. So there are problems with that. You understand? We, yes, can, we can defend ourselves, but uh, we can't actually be violent against somebody else. Mm -hmm. Someone else? Maharaj, uh, uh, I read that if someone is taking, uh, uh, is taking away your, your property, then you can defend or you can... <laughs> What, what do you say about that? Is it, anybody, ag land. do we agree with it? Somebody takes our property, somebody may take your wife away or something like that, you know, they, they steal your wife or something, they take your property or you do something like that. Are we justified to be violent with them? Is that proper use of violence? It may be according to Artha Shastra, but it's not according to Dharma Shastra. According to Dharma Shastra, you can't do that. Whereas if someone is offending our Guru or Vaishnava, then... Well, you're going to cut out their tongue? If someone is offending or if, if someone is getting violent on, uh, on a Guru or Maharaj or a Sannyasi or to a Vaishnava, then there, should, we then should... there can be... Yeah, we should defend them. Yes, we should defend them. But are we justified to be violent against someone? No. You can defend the guru, you can give protection to the guru, but you, you don't have 
the real right to be violent against someone. Uh, Maharaj, when an authority punishes a criminal? Oh, really? Do you, do you pun would you punish your children? Do you get violent with your children? No, Maharaj. Prabhupada said we shouldn't hit our children. Yes. Prabhupada didn't approve. Of, he said you can show the stick, you can threaten them, but you can't get violent. <laughs> no, no, I meant when, the, when a court punishes a murderer or some like... Yes, murderer. that's a good example. Yes, that's a very good example. That's given in Manu Samhita, that a murderer should be hanged. There's a death sentence for a, for a murderer. So that's proper use of violence. Somebody's been violent, somebody's killed somebody, they should be killed. That's proper use of violence. But the state, of course, they enact that, they do that. Sometimes the state may also use violence to establish law and order. If there's a lot of civil unrest in the country, then the, the government may use the army to establish law and order. That is proper use of violence. All right, what about the second question? What are current issues of religious violence? Are there any? Um, Maharaj, uh, this is basically a uh, misinterpretation of uh, uh, this uh, direct or we can say uh, Bhagavad Gita or Purana or other uh, Bible, we can say. So the message is same but the people are misinterpreting it. So uh, that is the only issue that, that is giving a right. Uh, 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 Arising all the uh, further issues, violence in the on the name of religious principles. Okay, so where is, give some examples of religious violence in the world? Uh, like uh, in Muslims, uh, it is uh, said uh, it is allowed to kill a cow, and they on the name of religiousness they kill cows or the other animals, but that is forbidden as per Srimad Bhagavatam. First Canto 9, 9 chapter 26 Shaloka says that it is forbidden to kill animals. So uh, we cannot kill even uh, in Bhagavad Gita, uh, Patram Pushpam Palam Toyam, there also it is said uh, not to kill animals. Okay. Anybody else like to comment? Current issues of religious violence? People kill in name of religion also. Yes. In the sense, if they don't, they are not following that particular faith, then they are considered as unbelievers or infidels, and then they kill. And there is a lot of uh, bomb blasts and all we can see happening in yes. uh, lots of parts of the world. Yes, right. Bomb blasts and things. Yeah, there's. The history of the world, actually, the history of the world, all the wars are all based on some kind of religious conflicts. The great crusades, it was all religious conflicts. And so it's just an ongoing thing in the world. And it's still going on today, of course. You have Hindu-Muslim riots, you have Muslim-Jewish uh, Jews conflicts. You have Catholic Protestant conflicts. It's all over the world. Of course, it's the bodily concept. It's all based on the bodily conception. It's not actually really religion. All right, going ahead, then the final point. Why did Krishna, who is all loving, incite Arjuna to war? Did we discuss this already? Why did Krishna, who is all loving, incite Arjuna to war? Any answers? Krishna 
Okay. Yeah, we could say that. That Lord Krishna uh, brought them together, brought in, encouraged Arjuna to fight war on religious principles. Lord Krishna comes to establish Dharma, and in order to establish Dharma, it was necessary for the war. That's one reason. Anything else? Ash, can we say that uh, whatever Krishna does is, is absolute in the sense that his apparent so-called killing is also loving in the sense whoever were engaged in the war, they, they got deliverance from the cycle of birth and death. So yeah. externally it may seem as violence, but it was for the ultimate good of everyone. Yes, it's a very nice point. Yes, very good. Yes. Ultimately, everything Krishna arranges is for the good of everyone. The people who are killed on the battlefield, you know, they all go back to Godhead. I was reading uh, a version of Valmiki Ra Ramayana, and it was describing about uh, the, you know those uh, monkeys. The, the monkeys. There was. Uh, there were these great monkeys who had, who had incarnated from different demigods and Vali was one of them. So Vali is described as being the friend of Lord Ramachandra, but Vali was killed by Lord Ramachandra. <laughs> so it's interesting, you know, and how, how does it happen that he's a friend of Lord Ramachandra but he's killed by Lord Rama? Well, he was, it was the arrangement that in order to bring the monkeys to help Lord Rama to search out Sita, Lord Rama had to get involved in the conflict between Vali and Sugriva, and Lord Rama had to kill Vali. And so, but actually Vali was, he's a friend of Lord Rama. They have a... Uh, he, he's, he's, he's the enemy, he's not the enemy. Well, Vali was surprised after he was killed by Lord Ram. He said, how you could do this to me, you know? <laughs> but, but Lord Rama explained to him, well, you, you, you've done things which, you're an animal. First of all, you were an, you're an animal, so there's no laws to protect you like human beings. And then you had acted against Dharma, you'd taken Sugriva's wife, and you'd done so many things wrong. And so like that, Lord Rama and similarly Lord Krishna, they're all loving, but they have to act, they have to do things. And, they, and Lord Krishna encourages Arjuna to war, to bring about a better situation in the world to establish the devotees, to rule the world, to establish real dharma. Okay, so violence certainly has its utility, but we should be very cautious about using violence. And we don't want to use it unless we have, it said, we should have control over our mind and senses without, before we try to use violence, we must be in control of the mind and senses. Otherwise we become controlled by the senses. That's not good. And then the violence becomes rash. So Prabhupada could get angry, but he could control it. He could be angry one minute and the next minute he would say, do something about it and he would be equipoised, he wouldn't be thrown off. But when people get violent, they get carried away. So we have to be very cautious about trying to use violence. It can degrade a person. All right, any questions, any comments further on this? Okay, well, go ahead. Someone like to read this for me, please? You can the take... devotee of the Lord does not retaliate against the wrongdoer. 
but the Lord does not tolerate any mischief done to the devotee by the miscreants. The Lord can excuse a person on his own account, but he excuses no one who has done harm to his devotees. Therefore, the Lord was determined to kill the miscreants, although Arjuna wanted to excuse them. 1.35 per birth. Thank you. So what were some of the, can you give some examples? Who, are, who were these wrongdoers? Who were the miscreants? Mischief done to the devotees by the miscreants? Can you give some examples about miscreants who did mischief? Okay, yes. Anything, any others? Paraji, uh, we have an example of uh, Pravasamani and uh, Amrish Maharaj. Okay, Dravasamani, yes. Yes. Anything else? Kans and Shishupal Maharaj. Shishupal and who else? Kans Maharaj. Kans. Comes. Okay. Yes. All right. So, Krishna takes care of them. The Lord was determined to kill the miscreants, although Arjuna wanted to excuse them. Right? <laughs> In the Kali Yuga, Lord Nichananda excused them, but this was not Kali Yuga. So, Krishna <laughs> not going to not going to excuse them. Kali Yuga is different. All right, someone else read? Yes, go ahead, read someone. If you insult his devotee, the devotee may excuse, but Krishna will not excuse. This is Krishna's position. Therefore, be careful to insult a devotee, a devotee may excuse you, but Krishna will not excuse you. Krishna is so strict. He cannot tolerate any insult to his devotee. Therefore, this arrangement of fighting Arjuna wanted. Therefore, this arrangement of fight, Arjuna wanted, no, let them be excused. Krishna wanted, no, you must fight, you must kill them. Okay, a devotee may excuse them, but Krishna will not excuse you. Krishna is so strict. He cannot tolerate the insult to devotees. So, who, who, particularly which devotee has been insulted here? Arjuna. Yes, Draupadi has been insulted, right? That's certainly a very strong factor in favour of why they have to have this battle, that Draupadi has been very much in, very insulted. There has to be some uh, arrangement to satisfy her. Any other examples about this, where devotees are not, ex where somebody insults a devotee? And they suffer for it? Hi, Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Maharaj, I heard in a lecture, uh, uh, it comes from uh, Sri Chaitanya Chaitanya, that uh, uh, a person called Chapal Gopal, who chastised Sri Vas Thakur, uh, so later on he uh, affected by some disease and uh, he went to Sri Lord Chaitanya. So, um, Bhagavan Chaitanya did not forgive him and Ask him to go to Shiva's Thakur for ask forgiveness. Yes, right. Yes, he got leprosy actually, that Gopal yeah. Chapala. He got leprosy, he had to leave the village, he had to go out the village and his whole body became riddled with leprosy and until he got forgiveness from Shiva's Thakur, he had to suffer. All right. We'll go ahead. Maharaj. Yes. Maharaj, please may I ask you a question over here. Okay. Uh, Maharaj, uh, in this uh, thing we read, it says that uh, devotee may excuse our ins insults or offenses, but Krishna doesn't. So what happens like, you know, in our family, our sib siblings take up to Krishna consciousness and like since childhood like you know we fight and stuff like that and you know all that stuff and then we become devotees and sometimes you know we still like fight insult each other so can you please throw some light on that well hopefully in the family you know you have quarrels and fighting and so on it's not very serious you know we 
we don't take, you know, we hope that, uh, that naturally there'll be some friction between each other, you don't always agree with each other, but somehow or other you put things aside and you get along because you're a family. And so Krishna understands that situation. The mood is not so serious that although there's disagreements and arguing and so on, that it's not a very deep mood of agitation and disturbance that somehow you're able to put up with each other because you have some family relationship. So Krishna can, you know, he will, he will allow these, tolerate this kind of arguing. You know, Krishna also has family, he also knows what it's like sometimes, you know. Sometimes, you know, Satyabhama wants something, Rukmini's got something, and Satyabhama's got something, she, Rukmini's got it, Satyabhama wants it, so Krishna knows something like this. And then Shaimantaka Jewel was also there, there was problems with the Shaimantaka Jewel who had taken it and everything. And so these things are there, you know, they're not very deep things, not very big things. But, you know, it wouldn't be a, a serious, you wouldn't, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't be insulting each other, we hope. Although there may be some disagreements, it wouldn't come to the point that you start insulting, you know, like disrobing, like they tried to disrobe Draupadi married woman in front of so many men, you know, that kind of thing, that's very serious, right? And so there's different degrees of offences, so it's not just all one. You understand? Yes, Maharaj, thank you for that. Okay, we'll go ahead. Someone can read the next slide, please. Yes. Yes, please read. The Kshatriya are specially trained for challenging and killing because religious violence is sometimes a necessary factor. 2.31. Lord Krishna and Arjuna, the Lord's eternal friend, had no need to fight in the battle of Kurukshetra, but they fought to teach people in general that. Violence is also necessary in a situation where good arguments fail. Because before the battle of Kurukshetra, every effort was made to avoid the war. Even by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, but the other party was determined to fight. So for such a right cause, there is a necessity for fighting. Thank you. So Srila Prabhupada is giving us some examples of where there's a need for violence, where good arguments fail. <laughs> Here you have the situation, your good arguments failed to resolve the conflicts between the Kauravas and the Pandavas, and there was no other solution but to go to war. The battle of Kurukshetra could not be avoided. Although they made great efforts, they tried, but they couldn't avoid it. So, for the right cause, there's a necessity for fighting. And the Kshatriyas are trained like this, they're trained for challenging and killing because this is their duty, their duty is to give protection and in the course of giving protection they have to challenge other people. So Kshatriyas are prepared to lay down their lives in these kind of situations. And of course the training, the example is there how the in the past, the, the kings of Jaipur, they were given a sword and they would go out into the jungle and they would have to hunt a tiger. And they have to kill the tiger with their, with their sword, practically, with their bare hands. And then only they are qualified to become the king or to sit on the throne in Jaipur. And the heads of so many different tigers are there in the palace at Jaipur. You can see the, what how they brought back the, the beast. They won the right to sit on the throne. 
So this is Kshatriyas, they have that mood, and they're trained. And they're prepared to die on the battlefield. They don't go home defeated. This is another aspect of the Kshatriya duty, that he may go, he may, either he will win the, va the war or he will die on the battlefield, but he does not go home defeated. And Prabhupada told the story that there was this one king, <coughs> he came back after the war and he had no army and he told, open the doors, I'm your husband, open the doors, let me in. I've been defeated, I went to the war, I got defeated. And the queen, the queen replied, my husband does not come home defeated. Either he wins the war or he will die on the battlefield. So she said, you cannot be my husband, you must be some imposter, so don't open the doors. <laughs> so they didn't let him in. So <laughs> that's the example. Okay, going ahead, this very nice verse from Bhagavad Gita. All right, someone like to read it and read the Sanskrit and the verse, please? Let's hear your nice Sanskrit. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Madhati, please. I need to read the English translation of Sumara. Yes. As a person put on new garment, giving up old ones, the soul similarly accepts new material bodies, giving up the old and useless ones. All right, so when you get a new dress, you're happy, right? When you get a new sari, you're very happy, you like to wear the new clothes, show everyone, you like my new sari, you like my new dress. We don't lament when we get a new, the new cloth. In the same way, when we get a new body, there's no reason to lament. I remember some years ago, uh, his Holiness Bhakti Charu Swami had gone to hospital to check his heart. He was having some heart problem and he went there to the hospital and the, the devotees were very worried. They were all crying and everything. And when he came home, when he came back from the hospital, he chastised them. He said, why are you crying? He said, you know, if you get a new car, you don't cry. When you give up the old car and you get a new car, you're happy with the new car. You don't worry about the old car. And when you get the new dress, you're not lamenting about the old dress. So the body is like that. It's like the old vehicle or the old dress. So you give up the old useless one, you get a new one. No reason to lament. Very nice example given by Lord Krishna. All right, let's have somebody else chant the next verse. Yes, please. I have to get your names, I will call your names. Achetyo yam adhar, adhar pyo yam, akletyo shosha evacha, nitya sarva gata sthano, achalo yam sanatana. Yes. This individual soul is unbreakable and insoluble and can be neither burnt nor dried. He is everlasting, present everywhere, unchangeable, immovable, and eternally the same. All right, so more descriptions of the soul. And particularly, we're going to look at this word sarvagata. Sarvagata meaning is everywhere, right? Sarvagata, all pervading. Go ahead, Prabhu, you can read this. The word Sarvagata, all pervading, is significant because there is no doubt that living entities are all over God's creation. They live on the land, in the water, in the air, within the earth, and even within fire. The belief that they are sterilized in fire is not acceptable because it is clearly stated here that the soul cannot be burned by fire. Therefore, there is no doubt that there are living entities also in the sun planet with suitable bodies to live there. 
All right, so within the fire even there are living entities. We used to think that when you sterilize something, you get rid of all the, all the germs, everything there. But no, there's many different forms of life live in fire. And Prabhupada gives the example, he said, just like a, a lump of opium, he said, opium is a poison, but within the poison there are different living entities. There's some living entities that live there within the opium. So they can live. What is poison for us is actually quite suitable existence for some other living entity. And so in the same way, we're not able to live in water, but we know there's many living entities living in the, in the water. And within the air also, there's so many different things living, and within the fire also. So this way we understand life is everywhere. Wherever you go, you'll find life. So people think there's only life on the, on the earth planet. They think there's no life on the other planet. It's nonsense. Living entities are everywhere, all over the creation. And Prabhupada is saying here, the sun planet also. You have a suitable body, if you have a, a fire body, you can also live there on the sun planet. Sarvagata, all-pervading. It accepts all types of bodies, such as that of man, devas, bird and beast, one after another, according to karma. So, living entities are everywhere. We don't think life is just limited to this one planet. All right. Can someone please read this next section for us? Who is not read? Hare Krishna. Yes, please read. There are still yogis in India who early in the morning take a bath in four dhamas, Ardwar, Jagannath Puri, Rameshwaram and Dwarka. Within one hour they'll take a bath in four places, they'll sit down in one place and by the yogic process within few minutes will get up and dip in this water. So the spirit soul has so much freedom, Sarvatata, to go anywhere he likes but our impediment is this body which uh, retires our freedom. <coughs> right. So Prabhupada is describing about some people who got the, this mystic yoga power that they can take bath in one place and next minute they'll come up in another place, far away. And so they, some people have this yoga power. So this, and Prabhupada said, the, the spirit soul has so much freedom, can go anywhere he likes. But our impediment is the body. Because of the, our body cannot go everywhere, but the soul can go. The soul can leave, go to these different places. Can you keep reading Prabhu, please? Yes. So if you can get rid of this material body and be situated in the spiritual body, you may be just like Narada Muni, who can move anywhere. He has a spiritual body, he is free to move anywhere, like spacemen who, who are trying to travel in space by machines. There is no necessity for machines. Yanartha Maya. The machine is made of Maya, but you have your own power, which is very speedy, but it is being curtailed. Therefore, one should be very careful how to get the soul out of the enchantment of this material body. That should be our first concern. Our Gita 2.5, 25 Thank you, Prabhu. Yes. So, so Prabhupada is explaining like this. Prabhupada is giving the example of Narada Muni. He's a spaceman, eternal spaceman. He has a spiritual body. So sometimes he's traveling in the spiritual world and sometimes he's in the material world. He can go anywhere. He doesn't need a machine. And then Prabhupada quotes Bhagavad Gita, Yantra Rudrani Mayaya. Rudani, Rancha, Yantra Rudani Mayaya. Right? We're seated on a machine made of the material nature. And so the the body is like the material nature is like a machine. So 
we have your, Prabhupada said, you have your own power, very speedy, but is being curtailed. You should be very careful how to get the soul out of the entanglement or the engagement of the body. So we're in this material body, in real purpose, practicing this bhakti yoga is to get free of birth and death and to get out of this material body. Then we can experience real freedom. So long as we have the material body, we're not free. But once we get rid of that body, we have to, and to get rid of it, we have to, we have to practice Krishna consciousness. It's a process to get free of birth and death. Okay, so we'll go ahead here. Yes, someone like to read for us? Who's good in chanting Sanskrit? Yes, go ahead. Atachainam nitya chatam nityam vamanya sevritam tathapi tvam mahabaho nainam shochitam arhasi if, however, you think that the symptoms or the symptoms, sorry, if you think that the soul or the symptoms of life is always born and dies forever, you still have no reason to lament, O oh mighty young. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Lord Krishna is describing here, because there are different philosophies, people have different philosophies. If you think that the soul is always born and dies forever, you have no reason to lament. Hmm? If the soul is, some people describe like that. They say, if you, some Buddhist masters, some of the Buddhist teachers, say describe the soul, that. They talk about the soul, but they have a material understanding of the soul. And they say that ultimately the soul will become nothing, because that's the Buddhist philosophy. The Buddhist philosophy is about the voidism, right? They want to make everything void, and they say ultimately there's nothing. So the soul also becomes nothing. So they have a material conception. And then, there, of course, there are people who don't believe in the soul at all. They think it's just in the body, it's only the body. Anyway, whatever philosophy you believe in, either way, you should fight. Lord Krishna is explaining these different philosophies to defeat all of Arjuna's arguments. Right? Can someone read this for us? Alkisha Maharaj. Yes. Krishna first explained the soul's eternity. Now, for the sake of completeness, he argues on the basis of principles presented by other philosophers, namely atheists and Buddhists. Right. Atheists. So, what does the atheists think? They, they don't believe in a soul at all. They simply think there's no God, there's no soul, there's only the body, there's only the senses. So the goal of life is just to enjoy, right? And the Buddhists, the Buddhists are also atheists actually. They also don't believe in God. They may say, you may say, well, they believe in Buddha, Buddha's God. No, they don't believe that. If you ask a Buddhist, that, is Buddha God? They'll say, no, Buddha is not God. He's not man and he's not God. He is Buddha. <laughs> So, you have to deal with the Buddhists, it's quite tricky, you know, you, get, you can really <laughs> have difficult arguments with them. Anyway, Buddhists, they believe, they make, some Buddhist masters do speak about the soul, but as I said, they have a material understanding of the soul, and they think the soul is created and it can be destroyed. They don't believe in the eternal spiritual nature. So, Krishna is explaining the soul's eternality, but he wants to explain about other philosophies. For the sake of completeness, he's presenting other philosophies, atheism and Buddhism. All right, the next part. Yes, Maharaj. Yes. Krishna 
Now there's a bit more here. Yes, go ahead, Maharaji. If all the assembled warriors are factually eternal souls, there is no reason for lamentation because no one will die on the battlefield. But if Arjuna accepts the argument for non-existence of the soul, then he should not be afraid to fight. After all, how can he be a killer of a combination of chemicals? Oh, <laughs> right? If there's no soul, right? If Arjuna accepts the argument of the non-existence of the soul, in other words, there's no soul, then he should not be afraid to fight. Why? Because who is he killing? He's just killing a combination of chemicals. Everyone's just a combination of chemicals, right? You are a combination of chemicals. Yeah, you know, I don't think if, if you're a married person and you tell your wife, you know, you know, my dear wife, you're just a, a bag of chemicals, you know, it, it's not very, it's not a very nice compliment for someone. But this is the philosophy. If you don't believe in the soul, then what is life? Then life is just simply a combination of chemicals. So that's, so, so Prabhupada, or the point is made here that if Arjuna says there's no soul, then you should still fight because you're just killing chemicals. It's no problem. It's not a big loss. Some chemicals, there's so many more chemicals. And if we are all eternal souls, there's no reason to lament. Why? Because no one will die on the battlefield because we're all souls. We're all souls, we're not the body, right? Remember I told you what, when they asked Prabhupada, how old are you? What did Prabhupada say? Do you remember? When the young man asked Prabhupada, how old are you? What did Prabhupada say? You don't know? You want to bring them to the spiritual platform. What are you going to say? Hmm? Please, I want to hear from you. You cannot grow old because they are souls? Yes, right, we're souls. He, he would, Prabhupada would simply say, I am the same age as you because I'm a soul and you're also a soul. So we're the same age. You may be in a young body and I may be in an old body, but we're, the, we're all souls. The bodies are different, but the soul's the same. The soul's eternal. And so this way Prabhupada would bring them to the higher consciousness. Instead of thinking we're the body, understand we're all souls. So this is important. So can you appreciate these two arguments? If we're all souls, then you should fight. Because if we're souls, the soul's eternal. You're not going to kill the soul. Soul cannot be cut by any weapon, burned by fire, moistened by water, withered by the wind. None of these weapons can harm the soul. So there's no problem. Nobody's going to die on the battlefield, just going to change the body. And if, if there's no soul, then also you don't have to worry. Why? Because we're just chemicals. So why are you worried about some chemicals? Of course, we don't believe we're just chemicals, but some people believe like that. They don't believe in the soul. So who are they? They're just chemicals. Understand? Yes, Maharaj. Okay. Thus, whether the soul exists or not, Arjuna should not lament, but should fight. So, very conclusive arguments. You see, Krishna is very expert in defeating these different reasons for not fighting. All right, who's going to read this one? Yes? So, 
So in any case, Srila Prabhupada concludes, so in any case, whether Arjuna accepted the Vedic conclusion that there is an atomic soul or he did not believe in the existence of the soul, he had no reason to learn. According to this theory, since there are so many living entities generating out of matter every moment, and so many of them are being vanquished every moment, there is no need to grieve for such incidents. If there were no birth, rebirth for the soul, Arjuna had no reason to be afraid of being affected by sinful reactions due to his killing of his grandfather and teacher. But at the same time, Krishna sarcastically addressed Arjuna as Mahabha, mighty arm, because he at least did not accept the theory of Vaibhashikas, which, which leaves aside the Vedic wisdom. As a Kshatriya, Arjuna belonged to the Vedic culture and it behooved him to continue to follow its principles, Parpa 26. All right, so the theory of Vaibhashikas, Vaibhashikas, there's a couple of philosophies like this mentioned in Prabhupada's purport. So Vaibhashikas, as Prabhupada said, they leave aside the Vedic wisdom. So how do they understand life? They don't believe in the soul. Or they say life is just simply a combination of chemicals. It's come about due to actions of the elements in the material nature. And you, you may say that it's like evolution. They believe in evolution. Life has evolved from lower forms of life to higher forms of life. You know, you get these different philosophies, foolish atheistic ideas which are totally against the Vedic wisdom. Evolution, Vaibhashikas, Lokashikas, these different philosophies, Buddhism, so many different things. They don't understand properly the nature of the soul. If they do talk of the soul, they have a material understanding. But often they just simply say there's no soul. And they, they discuss many Buddhism, the Buddhist philosophy is often called anatma, no soul. They don't, but some people do speak about the soul. But when they speak about the soul, they speak about it in a material way that ultimately there's nothing, ultimately there's only the, the, the void, there's only the nir, nipan, or the nirvana, the nothingness. So, Arjuna belongs to the Vedic culture, he has to follow its principles, and so he shouldn't be worried. As Prabhupada explains, uh, the Vedic conclusion is there's an atomic soul and that atomic soul is not going to die, it's eternal. Then it's that according to this theory, meaning different atheistic theories, living entities are generated out of matter every moment, being vanquished. Why, why worry about it? There's so many, there's, if there is no rebirth for the soul, there's no reason to lament. We're just chemicals. Okay? So, Prabhupada is defeating these arguments. Go ahead, Prabhu, read the rest of this. Same one, Maharaj. Oh, that's the same. same one, sorry, okay. okay. All right, let's have someone else read. According to this theory, Yeah? Yeah, we read this one. Okay, next verse. Text number 27. Read Sanskrit and English, please. Hare Krishna, who's not read? Jatasya. Yeah, go ahead. Jatasya hidruho mrityur. Dhruvam janma mṛtasya ca tasmā da parihāryatye natvam sochitum arhasi 
one who has taken his birth is sure to die and after death one is sure to take birth again therefore in the unavoidable discharge of your duty you should not love 2.2 okay this is a nice verse to quote sometimes and people need to hear this we've taken birth because we've taken birth we have to die but what is death death is just simply the change of body so we after death then we take birth again we're going to take another body that is what the law of nature is the nature of life we take one body we live in one body for some time according to our karma and then we give up that body and we'll take another body so lord krishna is explaining this you shouldn't avoid doing your duty and you shouldn't lament we should understand the nature of life krishna is still dealing with arjuna's uh, argument of compassion why why you know arjuna is thinking being compassionate don't kill don't but everybody going to die that's inevitable for everyone Prabhupada said the death rate is the same as always been the death rate is a hundred percent nobody conquers over death everyone has to die we take a birth in the world you have to die leave the body but the next life that's important where are you going to take your next birth that's important and so devotee is very careful to make the best use of this life so that we can get the good birth in the next life. Srila Prabhupada's purport. Yes, Prabhu, you can read for us who read the verse. One has to take birth according to one's activities of life, and after finishing one term of activities, one has to die to take birth for the next. In this way, one is going through one cycle of birth and death after one after another without liberation. This cycle of birth and death, death does not, however, support unnecessary murder, slaughter, and war. But at the same time, violence and war are inevitable factors in human society for keeping law and order. Yeah, there's a bit more. Go ahead. The battle of Kurukshetra being the will of the Supreme was an inevitable event and to fight for the right cause is the duty of the Kshatriya. Why should Arjuna be afraid of or aggrieved at the death of his relatives since he was discharging his proper duty? He did not deserve to break the law, thereby becoming subjected to the reactions of sinful acts of which he was so afraid. By avoiding the discharge of his proper duty, he would not be able to stop the death of his relatives and he would be degraded due to his selection of the wrong path of action. To, uh, point 27. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, Prabhu. All right, so Prabhupada is describing here the, the nature of duty cycle of birth and death doesn't support murder slaughter and war but sometimes violence is inevitable just to keep law and order it's necessary so we said battle battle of kurukshetra was necessary you couldn't avoid it and then uh, arjuna's duty he shouldn't be afraid he shouldn't be so much concerned about the death of his relatives he didn't he did not deserve to break the he did not deserve to break the law so he, arjuna is worried about the sinful reactions but by if he if he avoids the proper duty then he is going to be guilty of he, he's going to get sinful reactions and by not doing his duty, by not doing what he was supposed to do, he's bringing sinful reactions on himself. But if he will perform his duty properly, he will see he doesn't get reactions. Just by not doing his duty, he won't be able to stop the death of his relatives. And he will be, he will be degraded 
because he took the wrong path, he, did the wrong, he made the wrong choice. If he chose not to fight, that's the wrong path, he's going to get problems, it's going to disgrace him, it's going to be put into uh, disrepute. People will not honour him anymore. And he's a Maharati. So one who has been honoured, dishonour is worse, worse than death. So it will be very painful for Arjuna. Okay, we'll go ahead, text number 28. Who's going to read? Who's still not read? Yes? Hi. Yes? Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Avyakta dini bhuta ni vyakta madhya ni bharata avyakta nidana ni eva tatra ka paridevana all created beings are unmanifest in their beginning, manifest in their interim state, and unmanif unmanifest again when annihilated. So, what need is there for lamentation? Mm. Thank you very much. Yes, Lord Krishna is describing here phases of time unmanifested in the beginning, then manifest, and then unmanifest again. Why lament? Read Madhiji. Purpur here. Maharaji, who read that sloka, you please continue read the purpur. The material body, the material body has no factual existence in relation to the eternal soul. It is something like a dream. In a dream, we may think of flying in the sky or sitting on a chariot as a king. But when we wake up, we can see that we are neither in the sky nor seated on a chariot. The Vedic wisdom encourages self-realization on the basis of the non-existence of material body. Therefore, in either case, whether one believes in the existence of the soul or one does not believe in the existence of the soul, there is no cause for lamentation for those of the body. Hmm. Wait. Oh, that's, okay. All right. So, Prabhupada is explaining here, just like a dream, the material body is just like a dream. We're dreaming like that. We're dreaming, I'm this body. We're dreaming, I'm a man, I'm a woman. Like that. We do identify with the body. But it's just like a dream. In the dream, we dream so many things. Not real. We dream a tiger is chasing us. It's not really happening. So, we have to, we have to see through the illusion of the material world. Therefore, we have to become self-realized. We have to understand our actual identity as spiritual beings. This is the Vedic wisdom, to understand our real self as a spiritual person. So, but then Prabhupada says, whether you believe in the soul or not, that still that you don't have to lament for the loss of the body. Why not? Why don't we lament for the loss of the body if there's no soul? What's the it's argument? It's a bag of, bag of chemicals, Mother. Yes, right. Just it's just a bag of chemicals. So, loss of chemicals, we don't have to lament. Yeah, just a bag of chemicals, really. No. Thank you, Prabhu. A bag of chemicals, so no reason to lament. And if we are a soul, would we lament? No Maharaj, because it has no death. Soul never dies. Yeah, soul never dies, right. Simply changes the body. So no reason to lament. Okay, very good. So we're going ahead, text number 29. Very nice verse. These are such wonderful verses in the Bhagavad Gita. We need to know them, we need to use them in our preaching. Why do you think it's so important? What, can, you, can you see the relevance of these, these verses in our ordinary preaching to people? It's so important for us because pe everywhere people are so much in the bodily conception of life. They're so absorbed in the body and, we're so, and we identify with this body so much. And until we understand ourselves as a spiritual being, we'll never be able to understand Krishna. It, so this is why Krishna in the very beginning of the Bhagavad Gita, he's put this section in the difference between the body and the soul. But if we want to understand Krishna 
First thing is we have to know who we are. Someone wants to understand Krishna, well, I can't understand this person, Krishna, I can't understand him. Well, you, do you understand who you are? They don't understand that. Then, of course, you won't understand who Krishna is. If, you, if someone cannot understand themselves as a spiritual being, they'll never understand Krishna as the supreme spiritual being. So this is a problem. This is why so many people, they cannot understand Krishna. They think Krishna is just an ordinary person, or he was just a great person in history, or he's just, you know, and he died, he took birth and he died just like us. They don't understand that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and he has a fully spiritual body. But before they can understand Krishna, they have to understand that we are also spiritual beings, but we are in a material body. And so text number 29 brings out some of the different understandings of the soul. Who would like to read this nice verse for us? Some of the, Someone who's good in there, this nice Sanskrit, you're chanting so nice. May I read my verse? Yes, go ahead Prabhu. Yes, very good. Read. Some look on the soul as amazing. Some describe him as amazing. And some hear of him as amazing. While others, even after hearing about him, cannot understand him at all. That's amazing also, right? <laughs> Even after hearing about him, they cannot understand him at all. That is also amazing. <laughs> so, okay. And then we have from Prabhupada's purport. Yes, Prabhu, can you read it? Because of the astonishing, ashcharyavar nature of the soul, it is very difficult subject matter to grasp. Therefore, in spite of being exhaustively explained to Krishna in the beginning of Bhagavad Gita, People understand it in completely different ways. Thus, varieties of philosophies appeared due to different misunderstandings about the nature of the soul. Right. Different philosophies appear. Different misunderstandings about the nature of the soul. Huh. Mm -hmm. oh. We refer to the uh, Barijan Prabhu's book, Surrender Unto Me. So in uh, Barijan Prabhu's book, Surrender Unto Me, he's describing how this verse can be translated in different ways. And the word as, uh, Ascharyavat can, can be applied in relation to not only the soul, uh, here it says some, lo some look on the soul is amazing, and it could also be that, uh, it, that the people are amazing who look on the soul, and it can also be some look amazingly on the soul. <laughs> so, you know, the, the nature of the Sanskrit language is such that you can interpret these uh, phrases in different ways. So, the, from the verse we see different ways in which people can interpret this verse. And the, the same happens with the soul. We get different varieties of philosophy. They may be using the Bhagavad Gita, but they're giving it all different interpretations. Srila uh, Prabhupada's purport. Yeah, can you read the purport, Prabhu? It is very difficult to find a man who perfectly understands the position of the super soul, the atomic soul, their respective functions and relationships and all other major and minor details. And it is still more difficult to find a man who has actually derived full benefit from the knowledge of the soul and who is able to describe the position of the soul in different aspects. But if somehow or other one is able to understand the subject matter of the soul, then one's life is successful. Jai. 
if one is somehow or other able to understand the subject matter of the soul, then one's life is successful. So, Prabhupada saying the difficulty, difficult, understand the position of the super soul. Of course, most, many people, they believe it, they're monists. The monists, they simply believe in one soul. They don't believe in the soul and super soul. They think they sim simply think soul only. The oneness, the, the, the monists, uh, they're talking about the Brahman within everyone. And so they're Advaita Vadis. They don't believe in the soul and super soul. They simply think the oneness. So that's there. That's an argument, one argument which comes up. And there are so many others. So it's still more difficult to find a man who has actually derived full benefit from knowledge of the soul. Just like we have knowledge of the soul, have we taken full benefit of that knowledge? We may know, we've learned, I'm not the body. But have we realized that? Have we actually realized this point? Are we able to apply that in our life? That I'm not the body, I'm a soul. Of course, it's very, very, very difficult. It's a very advanced stage to actually be detached from the body and to just think of herself as a soul. And so taking advantage, full benefit of that knowledge of the soul is important. And who is able to describe the position of the soul in different aspects? So we have different rules, each soul has a different relationship with the Lord. That is also there. What is the rasa there between the, the soul and the super soul, between the Lord and the living entity? So these things have to be understood very carefully to understand the real nature of the soul. So there's jnana, that's the knowledge. We simply learn, but then vigyan, the realization, to be able to apply that knowledge in practice, not so easy. If we understood, if we really realized we're not the body, we're the soul, then we won't need to eat so much, we won't need to sleep so much, <laughs> we won't spend so much time worrying about the body, we'll be on a higher level of consciousness, we'll be more concerned with the soul. So this point comes out in this verse. Okay. Prabhupada continues. Can you continue reading, Prabhu? The easiest process for understanding. The easiest process for understanding. <laughs> Go ahead, one of you. Continue. Okay. The easiest process for understanding the subject matter of self, however, is to accept the statements of the Bhagavad Gita spoken by the greatest authority, Lord Krishna, without being deviated by other theories. But it also requires a great deal of penance and sacrifice, either in this life or in the previous ones, before one is able to accept Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Krishna can, however, be known as such by the causeless mercy of the pure devotee and by no other way. 2.29. Oh, thank you. So a very uh, powerful purport here from Srila Prabhupada. That Prabhupada is saying, you, we need to do a lot of penance and sacrifice in this life or in previous ones before we're able to accept Krishna as the Personality of Godhead. So, you know, have we done that? You know, I don't think I did that. I don't know about you, but... But then how can we know Krishna? Well, we can know Krishna simply by the causeless mercy of the pure devotee and by no other way. So if we really want to understand Krishna, we have to get the mercy of the pure devotee. We have to take advantage of the mercy of the pure devotee. Of course, Srila Prabhupada is giving his mercy to everyone. Who is going to take advantage of it? 
if we take advantage of it, then we have to take part in the Krishna consciousness movement and the activities of the society. And we have to follow Prabhupada's program for Krishna consciousness by chanting and hearing from Srimad Bhagavatam, these things. And then we can take advantage of the mercy of the pure devotee. We can come to know Krishna. And then it, how much penance and sacrifice can we do? And, and it's very unlikely, very, very difficult for us in this age to do a lot of penance and sacrifices. But the mercy of the spiritual master is there when we take part in devotional activities, hearing and chanting. And this way then we can understand the soul. So Krishna has defeated Arjuna's... Hare Krishna Maharaj, I have a question in relation to what we just read, Maharaj. Okay. So is this correct understanding, Maharaj, that some form of piety is required to come to Krishna consciousness or... Because it says both. In the first half it says that, you know, to know Krishna, there is some, uh, there is a lot of penance and all required. But in the later half it says uh, about only the mercy of a pure devotee. So, I'm kind of confused here, Maharaj. Uh -huh. Well, to get the, the, accepting the mercy of the pure devotee also requires us to do some penance and sacrifice. We have to take initiation from the pure devotee, we take shelter and we follow his instructions. There's a lot of penance and sacrifice in that. But it's not like the penance and sacrifice as we are thinking maybe previous lives and so on that we have to do some great things, great penance. No, if the penance and austerities in relation to the pure devotee are all in relation to the bhakti yoga process. So we get the mercy of the spiritual master through bhakti yoga. But when we just read, we just hear about penance and sacrifice, we think, oh, I have to do these things. But certainly piety is required to understand Krishna. We know from the Bhagavad Gita, to take up bhakti, remember the verses there that People who have acted piously in previous lives and in this life and who are freed from the reactions of sinful activities, then they engage themselves in my service with determination. So the devotee read this verse and they went to Prabhupada and asked Prabhupada, so did I become a devotee because of my piety? So Prabhupada replied, do you know how Prabhupada replied? The no, Maharaj. The devotee asked, did I become a devotee because of my piety? Prabhupada said, I am creating your piety. So Prabhupada is creating also our penance and sacrifice also. That's our piety. It's all done through Srila Prabhupada. You accept Srila Prabhupada's instructions and you follow his teachings and you become qualified. We see in Srimad Bhagavatam also, they were asking, uh, Maharaj Rahugana was asking Jadbarat, where did you get this devotion? And what did Jadbarat say? He said, you only get it by taking the dust from the feet of the devotee. You have to take the dust of the feet of the devotee and smear it all over your body. So that means the mercy, the causeless mercy of the pure devotee. And similarly, Haranyakashipu asked Prahlad Maharaj, where did you get all this devotion? And Prahlad Maharaj said the same thing. You have to get it from the devotee. You get bhakti from a bhakta, from somebody who's got devotion. We don't get bhakti just simply by doing penances and sacrifices, but we get it from the devotee, somebody who's got bhakti, they can give us bhakti. All right? So that is the mercy of the pure devotee. And the pure devotee will arrange for us to do some kind of penance and sacrifice, you know. Sacrifice. What is sacrifice in the Kali Yuga? 
Kali Yuga Dharma Hari Nam Sankirtan. We do Sankirtan, that is the sacrifice, the Yuga Dharma. We don't think of it as a sacrifice, but that is actually the real sacrifice in the Kali Yuga. You engage in the Kirtan, the chanting of the holy name. And the penance, what is our penance? What penance do we do? Eat prasadam. <laughs> a great penance, right? So, do you understand the mercy of the pure devotee? Yes, Maharaj, thank you. So, so that means piety is definitely created when we come in contact with the pure devotee. Rest the things follow. Oh, yes, definitely. Yeah. Yes, Maharaj. There, thank you, Maharaj. There are different yes. levels of piety. You see, there's piety. It can be in the mode of passion. It can be in the mode of ignorance. It can be in the mode of goodness. So, th this is what we call uh, bhakti unmuli sukriti, right? Bhakti unmuli sukriti, the, I, the pious activities which bring us devotion. The pure devotee will engage us in, they will engage us in activities which will awaken our pure devotion, which will awaken our attraction for Krishna. The pure devotees, the, the spiritual teachers, they'll tell us, go on Sankirtan, go and join the Kirtan, chant the holy name. That's a sacrifice. You're getting a lot of spiritual benefit by that. When we join the Kirtan, we do the Kirtan, and when we read the Bhagavad Gita, we chant the verses of Bhagavad Gita, it's a great sacrifice. Very powerful. And it brings us the mercy of the pure devotee. All right? So this is how we can understand Krishna. We want to understand Krishna, we, need, we have to go through the pure devotees. And the pure devotees will give us the devotion. By the devotion we can understand Krishna. Krishna says he can only be understood by devotion. Where do we get devotion from? We get it from the devotees. We get it from the pure devotee. They give, they, they give devotion. Right? The pure devotee is the personification of a holy place. So by contacting the pure devotee, you come in touch with, 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 the, this, with that spiritual potency which can awaken our Krishna consciousness. We just have to take advantage to follow the instructions. Oh, is that all right? Yes, Maharaj, thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead. We're looking at how Krishna defeats Arjuna's arguments. So Arju Ar Arjuna's compassion has been defeated by Lord Krishna explaining jnana, or we may say sankhya, or simply he was explaining the knowledge of the soul and the difference between the soul and the body. And in this way Arjuna's compassion was completely defeated. Now, other reasons. Enjoyment, sinful reaction and indecision, they're also going to be thrown out the window when we hear about karma kanda. Karma kanda. The path of karma, the path of fruitive activities. Of course, karma kanda is not a spiritual activity, it's not on the yoga ladder, but Lord Krishna explains it a little bit briefly just to defeat some of Arjuna's reasons. Later on, Krishna will give a higher explanation, he'll give other reasons to defeat it, but he also is introducing this karma kanda concept just to help some people to understand how material desires can also be achieved through following the instructions of Lord Krishna. So Karma Kanda, we're going to hear text 31, right? Who would like to read this verse for us? You chant so nicely. I like to hear you chant more. 
Yes? Please, don't be shy. Who's not read? Okay, somebody so who's read, you can read again. Swadharma api chavichya nabi kampitu marhasi dharmya dhi yudha shreyo anyat kshatriyasya nabhidyate Considering your specific duty as a kshatriya, you should know that there is no better engagement for you than fighting on religious principles. And so, there is no need for hesitation. All right, so Krishna, Lord Krishna is stressing to Arjuna, you have your duty as a Kshatriya, so you should know you have to fight according to religious principles. No need to hesitate. Kshatriyas don't hesitate to fight. They're happy to go into the battle because it's an opportunity for them. What's the opportunity? If they, if they, what will happen to a Kshatriya? He dies on the battlefield. Where will he go? Heaven. Lord. Yes. He goes to Dhruva Loka. He will go to Dhruva Loka, will he? Oh, okay. Swarga Loka. Oh, Swarga Loka, right? Heaven. Swarga Loka, right? You go to heaven. So, will you enjoy there in heaven? If you go to heaven, is there enjoyment there? They say that, Maharaj. <laughs> huh? <laughs> they say so. They say so. Yeah, what kind of enjoyment have they got there? What are they doing? Much sophisticated material enjoyment, but at a very higher level, much more finer. Yeah. Subtle. They have long life, they have very good looks, they're very intelligent, they're pious, right? So all of these things are there. In the higher planets. There's no disease. They don't suffer like this. They don't have virus like us. <laughs> so people, some, for some people that's their goal. They like the, the thought of going to heaven. In, in places like Hong Kong, they will often name the apartment building as heaven. Even if we see our Bombay temple, they named that building Heaven on Earth, right? <laughs> Heaven on Earth, my goodness. Uh, they called that, when they put up that new building there in, in bon uh, at Juhu, they called that extension, the new extension with all the marriage halls, Heaven on Earth. Oh my goodness. So Heaven people, for some people that's the goal. They were happy to go to Heaven. Of course, you go to heaven, you cannot stay there, you have to come. So, so if Arjuna fights, and if he's killed in the battlefield, he goes to heaven. And if he wins the battle, then he enjoys the kingdom. But what happens if he doesn't fight? He will incur sinful reactions for not performing his duty. Yes. What will what will happen to him particularly? He will lose his fame, and uh, people will call him a coward. Yes, right. He will be called a coward. He will lose his fame, and he's he is, you know, he's a big name. He's a big man. He's a Maharati, so he's given a lot of respect and honor. So, is that very not not very easy for him? Is it very? Shameful for him, difficult. So he's encouraged, better you fight. Okay. Krishna answers Arjuna's objection of enjoyment. Dharmadi yajaj shreyanyat kshatriyasya navijyate. As a kshatriya, you should know there is no better engagement for you than fighting on religious principles. So we just explained Arjuna's going to enjoy. If he, if he doesn't fight, he won't enjoy, he will suffer. But if Arjuna fights, if he loses, he will go to heaven, and if he wins, he will enjoy the kingdom.
So both ways, win or lose, he's going to enjoy if he fights. But if he doesn't fight, he's going to suffer. So this way Krishna has defeated Arjuna's objection. The, Arjuna was saying, I, I won't enjoy the I won't be able to enjoy. But Krishna said, no, you will if you fight. But if you don't fight, you won't enjoy. All right. Then we bring up the subject about prescribed duties, swadharma. All right. Someone like to read this for us? What is your swadharma, Prabhu? Your, your, your swadharma is to read for us. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, thank you, Maharaji. As long as one is not liberated, one has to perform the duties of his particular body in accordance with religious principles in order to achieve liberation. When one is liberated, one swadharma specific duty becomes spiritual and it is not in the material body concept. All right. So are you liberated, Maharaji? No, Prabhu. No, no, Maharaj. You're not liberated, right? Okay, you're like us. Yeah. So you're in the, so what, what is our duty? What do we have to do? What is our swadharma? To properly use this uh, human life in uh, realizing the Supreme Personality of Godhead Maharaj. Yes. Prabhupada explains. Read the next paragraph. One, the bodily plane Swadharma is called Vanasharma Dharma or man's stepping stone or ste ste uh, sorry, stepping stone for spiritual understanding. Discharging one's specific duty in any field of action in accordance with the orders of higher authorities serves to elevate one's, one to a higher status of life. So, Gita 2.31 So when we're not liberated, we have to do our Swadharma according to Varnashram Dharma, right? On the bodily plane, Swadharma is called Varnashram Dharma. According to Varnashram Dharma, of course, man stepping. So what about women? Well, women also have their Swadharma, Sri Dharma, right? Women's duties and men's duties, like that. So spiritual understanding. So we have to do our duties. And then Prabhupada concludes it at the end. Discharging one's duty in any field of action in accordance with the orders of higher authority serves to elevate one to a higher status of life. So follow the orders of higher authorities. That's always good for us. We accept the authority, accept somebody's, you know, somebody's our authority and we take their instructions, we do what they tell us to do, okay. That way we, we get, we're elevated. So two swadharmas, one is material, is you follow Varnashram, somebody's a Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Sudra, different duties, of course, we don't practice so much like that, we practice Daivi Varnashram. Daivi Varnashram means whatever you do, you do it for Krishna. Right? You may do work of a Brahmana, sometimes, sometimes you're working as a Sudra. Sometimes we're doing the puja, sometimes we're doing the cleaning, cooking. Sometimes we're doing the making money also, the Vaishya. And so you have to do a lot of things. So we do it all for Krishna, Devi Varnashram. We're not liberated, so we're following Varnashram Dharma. And somebody else is liberated, what, what about them? They also do their Swadharma on the liberated platform. They also have to do different things, religious principles, we have duties, they also have to, they have to do puja, they have to chant, they have to do different things. They're liberated souls, they may be liberated, but they have to act. So the swadharma, it may be spiritual, it may be material. The spiritual swadharma, 
We can read about, for example, the Goswamis. What were they doing? They were chanting, they were offering obeisances, worshipping the deity, studying the scriptures, all of these things. This is for the liberated souls. They spend their time in this way. So two types of Swadharma are there. Hare Krishna Maharaji. Yes. Hare yes. uh, Maharaji, can we uh, correlate uh, uh, Swadharma uh, with uh, constitutional position as stated in the uh, first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam? Constitutional duties or position is stated there. Uh, what, what part in the Srimad Bhagavatam are you talking about? In the first canto, I, I don't remember the... Samai Pumsa Paro Dharma? Samai Pumsa Paro Dharma? Is that what you mentioned? Well, can we, can we talk... Yes, you could call it... You can compare that to Swadharma on the liberated platform. <laughs> the supreme occupation for all humanity to attain loving service to the Lord. Such service must be unmotivated and uninterrupted. If, if, if you're talking like that, then that's the liberated platform. Okay. But if we're on the bodily platform, we have to act, we have to do our Swadharma according to Varnashram. That's the principle. Now, how we apply Varnashram, of course, can't get, we're not going to practice the traditional Varnashram, you know, that I'm a Brahmin, I only do what Brahmins do. No, we apply Varnashram in a very uh, flexible manner. We call it Daivi Varnashram. And the principle is to do, use everything, in this, do everything in the service of Krishna. Not that we're, we think, I'm a Brahmana, I can't do business, I'm a Kshatriya, I can't beg for anybody. You know, if you're a Kshatriya, then you can't go for Sankirtan, you can't go out and book distribution. <laughs> you can only protect people. No, we practice Daivi Vanashram. And so we use our different, whatever skills we have, we use it in the service of Krishna. So they're stepping, this is stepping stones for spiritual understanding. Vanashram is described like that helps us to gradually come to a higher consciousness, that we will come to the platform of devotion. On the bodily plane, we don't have a lot of devotion. Our attachment is to the body and our interest and concern is for the body and bodily relationships. But as we become purified, through the practice of Varnashram Dharma, then we come to the higher platform, we become, come to the liberated platform. Liberated platform means using body, mind and words in the service of Lord Krishna. Ihadashya hariyadashye karmana manasagira nikilas papiya vastasu jivan muktasu chate the one who uses body, mind and words in the service of Krishna as a liberated soul, even in this lifetime. So liberation is not something you have to wait for the next life. In this life we can be liberated. And by engaging in devotional service we also come to the liberated platform. Mamcha yovaya bicharina bhakti yogena sevati, right? By doing bhakti we transcend the modes of nature. Varnashram is concerned with the modes of nature. Are we free from passion and ignorance? If we're free of passion and ignorance, then you're liberated, then you're on the mode of pure goodness. Then that's the liberated platform. You can engage in it's, uh, your Swadharma is spiritual. But if we're not free of passion and ignorance, then we need to follow the Varnashram. And we need to gradually get free of this passion and ignorance, come to the mode of pure goodness. Is this all right? Are you clear? 
Thank you, thank you, Maharaj. That's cute. So two thanks for Dharma. All right? Both ways you have to fight. Both ways you have to fight. Krishna is trying to put Arjuna in the dilemma. This way or that way, you must have to fight. If you think that you are not in bodily concept of life, then it is my order. Right? You're not in the bodily concept of life, then you're under the orders of Krishna. It's your duty to surrender to Krishna. And Krishna is that it's my order. You must fight. But if you think that you are in bodily concept of life, then you are a Kshatriya. You must fight. Both ways you have to fight. This is Krishna's conclusion. So you see Arjuna's two Swadharmas. One is the first one is not in the bodily concept of life. He's a liberated soul. What is the duty of the liberated soul? The liberated soul's duty is to follow the order of Krishna. And if he's in the bodily concept of life, his duty is to follow Varnashram. And in Varnashram he's a Kshatriya. And the Kshatriya has to fight. So this is Krishna conscious, Krishna's conclusion, you see. <laughs> Krishna is so smart, he's so clever, you know, he's just defeated Arjuna every way. That you have to fight, you can't get out of this, no way. So, Arjuna defeats Ar Arjuna, Krishna defeats Arjuna's argument of sinful reactions. Swarga dwaram apavritam, O Partha, happy are the Kshatriyas to whom such fighting opportunities come unsought, opening for them the doors of the heavenly planets. Right? Krishna is telling Arjuna, this is Karmakanda, he said, you can go to heaven, you know, you want, you know, you will enjoy heaven, if even if the Kshatriyas are happy, even if they lose the battle, not a problem, they're going to die on the battlefield, they'll go to heaven, it opens the doors to heaven. Oh, enjoyment, karma, this is uh, Karmakanda, the path of enjoyment, we want to enjoy our karma. So Krishna is encouraging Arjuna that you will enjoy, you do your duty, you fight, you can go to heaven. Of course, the devotee doesn't want to go to heaven. And then, how to defeat Arjuna's argument about sinful reactions. Atachet tvam imam dharmyam sangramam na karishyasi tatasva dharmam kirtim cha if, however, you do not perform your religious duty of fighting, then you will certainly incur sins for neglecting your duties and thus lose your reputation as a fighter. So Arjuna was worried that if I fight, I will get sinful reactions. But here Krishna is saying, if you don't fight, you will get sinful reactions. <laughs> if you do not perform your duty, then you will certainly incur sins. So you, Krishna, every argument Arjuna gave, Krishna defeated each and every one of them. If you don't fight, you, that's sinful. You're going to get reactions. Prabhupada explains, if he abandons the battle, not only would he neglect his specific duty as a Kshatriya, but he would lose all his fame and good name, and thus prepare his royal road to hell. In other words, he would go to hell, not by fighting, but by withdrawing from battle. Arjuna was thinking if he fought, he would go to hell. Krishna said, if you don't fight, you're going to hell. Karmakanda, people will always speak of your infamy and for a respectable person dishonor is worse than death. Yeah. For one who has been honored, dishonor is worse than death. Certainly it's true, people who have 
when they're honored and then when they're dishonored, it's so painful. Then 35, that was 34, text 35, the great generals who have highly esteemed your name and fame will think that you have left the battlefield out of fear only, and thus they will consider you insignificant. Lord Krishna is really hitting into Arjuna that, you know, these other generals, they, had, they were respecting you, but if they see you leaving the battlefield, they're just going to think you were a coward. You left, you were afraid. They will never think of you again. They will consider you nothing. You, are, you will become nothing. You will become, you won't even be worthy to be the dust in their feet. So your name and fame will be ruined if you don't fight. And then text 36, your enemies will describe you in many unkind words and scorn your ability. What could be more painful for you? So in this way, Lord Krishna is explaining to Arjuna that you should really think carefully about this. You were saying you don't want to fight, but if you don't fight, you're going to really bring problems on yourself. So Arjuna was argue, he was arguing about sinful reactions, but Lord Krishna shows that his arguments were not substantial, they were unfavorable, they did not establish any real purpose. Krishna answers Arjuna's objection of indecision. Arjuna was saying, I don't know, should I fight? I don't know what I should do, is it right or wrong? Remember in the beginning of second chapter? So now Lord Krishna is saying, O son of Kunti, either, either you will be killed on the battlefield and attain the heavenly planets, or you will conquer and enjoy the earthly kingdom. You don't have to be indecisive about it. Both ways you will enjoy. You should be sure. It's good. Be, deci be decisive about doing something. If you're indecisive, oh, I don't know, oh, should I do it? But if you're very decisive about it, then either you're going to be killed on the battlefield or you will conquer and enjoy the kingdom. And so another argument of, Krishna, of Arjuna's is defeated. And now, text 38. Sukaduke same kritva laba labo jaya jayo tato yudhaya yajyasva naivam papam avapshyasi. Do thou fight for the sake of fighting without considering happiness or distress, loss or gain, victory or defeat, and by so doing you shall never incur sin. So Krishna, as we've put on the top here, we're, Krishna is making a transition. Lord Krishna was speaking about Sakama Karma Yoga, or you could, even it, it was worse, before it was Karma Kanda, then it became Sakama Karma Yoga, and now Krishna is bringing, bringing it to Niskam Karma Yoga. So progression there. Karma Kanda was very material, just simply outright desire to enjoy, but Sakama Karma Yoga was, okay, I'll do my duty, but I want to enjoy the result. But now Krishna is speaking Niskam Karma Yoga, and Krishna is saying, just do your duty, don't worry about happiness and distress. Sakama Karma Yoga, you're worried, you want to enjoy, you want to enjoy the results. But Niskam Karma Yoga, you don't think about it, victory or defeat, doesn't matter. That is Niskam Karma Yoga. That Niskam Karma Yoga, that is very close to Bhakti. So Lord Krishna has elevated the discussion. Prabhupada explains here, This is duty. One has to execute duty without any consideration of loss and gain. 
That is duty. Observing duty. Just see, you are Kshatriya. There is necessity of this fighting. So you should not consider whether you are gaining or losing. It is your duty to fight. If you examine your duty nicely, there is no question of sin. Right? You do your duty nicely, there is no sinful reaction there. Why? Because you are doing it as a sense of duty. It is my duty. Not, you are not just doing it for the gain or, or loss. You are not doing it just to enjoy. You are just simply doing it as a sense of, it is a responsibility. I have to do it for Krishna, of course. We are thinking, do it for Krishna. Alright? So, it is a nice quote here. So, we have seen Karmakanda explained here in these verses 31 to 38. And by Karmakanda, by explaining the philosophy of Karmakanda, Lord Krishna has defeated Arjuna's argument about sinful reactions, indecision and enjoyment. And now finally, this transition from Sakama Karma Yoga to Niskam Karma Yoga. Prabhupada explains, Sama means equanimity, being unchanged in all circumstances. That means one remains the same person in glory or infamy, opulence or poverty. That is equanimity. We can understand. It's not very easy to come to that platform. It's an advanced stage to be. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur he comments on this. You will not incur sin as long as you are endowed with this equanimity. This is also described later in Bhagavad Gita 5.10. Lipyate na sa papena padma patram ivambasa. One becomes sinful or bound by action if he is attached to the fruits of his actions. Srila Prabhupada's purport brings this verse to the level of bhakti. Lord Krishna now directly says that Arjuna should fight for the sake of fighting because he desires the battle. There is no consideration of happiness or distress, profit or gain, victory or defeat in the activities of Krishna consciousness. Everything should be performed for the sake of Krishna's. For the sake of Krishna is transcendental consciousness. So there is no reaction to material activities. From the purport of text number 38. All right? So we've completed the lesson today. Just to review what we've been discussing. Uh, first of all, understanding, we explained the process of transmigration, text 22, remember, Vashamsi Janani Nata Vihaya, changing the dress, like changing the body, transmigration. So death is simply the change of the dress, it's the change of the body. And then we discussed about Swadharma, two types of Swadharma, one for liberated souls and one for people in the material world, not liberated. Those who are not liberated, they follow Varnashram. And we give the practical approach to following Varnashram according to our position. According to our position, hmm, you know, for different people it's going to be different. Do what we're supposed to do. Some, it may mean taking instructions from superiors. That's also part of Varnashram. Then preaching application, appropriate and inappropriate application of the utility of violence in relation to the battle of Kurukshetra and current issues of religious violence. So the utility of violence, we spoke about that, that there is proper use of violence, it's in some situations it's appropriate. In some, some situations it's not. We have to be very cautious 
about how to use violence. It shouldn't be uh, rash and just simply motivated by the mode of passion or ignorance. That is the point. And then the spirit of a Kshatriya, described text 33 to 35, the spirit of the Kshatriya, that he will die on the battlefield. It's a, he's happy to take part in the battle. He's come to enjoy the battle. And even he dies on the battlefield, it's not a problem because he will go to heaven. And if he wins, he will enjoy the kingdom. He doesn't go home defeated. So Krishna defeated Arjuna's arguments such as fear from sinful reaction. Krishna said sinful reactions will come if you don't do your duty. And enjoyment. Krishna said you, you will enjoy, win or lose the battle, but if you don't fight you won't. And then indecision. Krishna said, you have to decide, you have to, you have to do it. You've come to the battlefield, now you have to do it. In this way, Krishna is defeating Arjuna's arguments. A final quote from Śrīla Prabhupāda, Therefore, this is a panacea to engage everyone in Krishna consciousness, chanting Hare Krishna. He comes above the highest principle of Brahmanism. This is the greatest gift to the humanity, that even he is in the fallen condition, the most degraded position, he can be raised to the highest position simply by chanting. This is the only remedy. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. All right. Are there, are there some questions? Oh, tomorrow, next week we're going to go on. We'll continue. We still have. We haven't finished the uh, second chapter, so you can prepare the rest of the second chapter for next week. Are there any questions or comments? Anyone? Hare Krishna, Maharaji. Yes, Prabhu. Maharaji just wanted to ask that, uh, uh, wanted to confirm for our OBA uh, open book examination or the assess, uh, what should we write for? Oh yes. Uh, well, I'll tell you next week. I'll look over the okay. I'll look over the questions, and I'll tell you next week. Remind me. Yeah. Sure. Not. Yeah. And we'll tell you. I think you have to write two essays for that. Okay, any other questions? Are you keeping up with everything okay? Not going too slow for you, is it? No worries. <laughs> okay. All right, so we'll see you next week. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai, Gorbhakta Vrinda Ki Jai. Yeah.